Well, welcome everyone. I'm Pastor David, uh, pastor of the Northside Madison campus, and I'm so glad that you all have joined us today uh, for this very important panel discussion. So we have a number of questions that we're going to ask and, um, you know, speak from your heart. We're all friends here. Um, but before we get to the questions, we're going to go around and ask you to introduce yourself. My name is Linda Larson, and I live in Stoughton, and I attend the Sprecher campus. My name is Carrie Anderson. I live in Sun Prairie and attend Sprecher in Northside Madison. Uh, my name is Bill Housley, and I, we live in DeForest, and we attend in DeForest. My name is Brad Scatterday. Uh, my my uh, wife and I live on the east side of Madison, and we attend Northside Madison. And we all know Pastor Mark, right? <laughs> Anything else you want to say, Pastor Mark, before we get started? Okay. All right. So, like I said, this is, um, you know, we want you to speak from your heart. And, you know, don't, don't think that anything that you say is going to be taken the wrong way. This is a, a very important discussion. So, let's jump right into the questions. How about that? And we'll start, we'll start with you, Linda. <laughs> Now, we'll just start the question, and if you feel you want to chime in, we won't put anyone on the spot for each question, all right? The first question is, what makes you feel uncomfortable or uneasy when discussions around race come up? I could uh, comment. I think the, uh, the walls of presupposition uh, can get in the way. And I often do, I think, where uh, uh, there, there can be assumptions made about the other person who you're conversing with and, or, or vice versa. And then it can be difficult to get around those walls and, and, and to break those down uh, of uh, assuming something, uh, assuming some trait or some uh, goal or, or something of the other person and there may be that other person thinking that about me and, and trying to dance around that can be difficult. I, I think I wonder at the beginning of a conversation if I don't know whom I'm speaking with, if they're new friends or people that I don't know, just how vulnerable can I be? Is this a safe place where I really can speak my heart, feel free to um, make mistakes, hear, you know, hear something different? Um, and I think it's, it'd be really nice to be able to know everybody's story before you walk into these kind of conversations. You're right. Um, I would say for me, I mean, it's a, it's a hard topic um, to come across. Um, I'm married to a black man. Um, I've kn I mean, I've dated him in high school. I've known him for a long time. Um, and we have these conversations constantly. Um, we have them with new friends, old friends, and, I th and family, of course. Bringing um, families together is, is another um, perspective. But I think the hardest thing for me is so many of our white friends and our family members will say, well, I'm just colorblind. Um, I don't see color. I treat everybody the same. Um, if you know, I just, I base everything off of their actions and their character. Um, sometimes in those conversations, they diminish and dismiss who my husband is, um, who my family is, who my friends are, by saying, well, you're just different. Um, you, you're not like the other black individuals. You're not like the other minorities. Um, and they don't see that he has struggles or that my family members have struggles. Um, we all see color. You can't deny it. If you have eyes and, and you're not blind, you can see that. Um, I think we all have good intentions that we want to judge based off of character. But like what you said, Linda, is you want to know people's stories. Um, and sometimes those stories get diminished um, and dismissed. Um, 
So that's that's where it becomes uneasy and uncomfortable for me. Yeah, I think for me, you know, you speak that you and your husband have these conversations constantly. Um, that's not always a conversation that my wife and I are having um, because uh, there's a lot of things that we just don't think about that because we don't necessarily uh, have to. And so there's helping understand, you know, that there's things that I could say that without the proper perspective, without the proper context uh, that of, of us having it when we say things, we could very easily offend somebody quite unintentionally. Uh, and that our, our desire is to never come across as, as racist or say racially offensive things, uh, but because we might not have lived experience, we don't have the context to see where that could be a problem. And so being able to properly have a conversation that like I have a, my sisters um, all have studied political science, one particular in policy and one particular in um, like racial justice issues. And so I've spent a lot of time talking to her and, and gave me a lot of context, but without that, I wouldn't, there was a lot of things that I might've said or could have said or wouldn't have said that I just wouldn't have simply have known would have been part of the problem. I really appreciate Carrie. Uh, what you said about people who say, I don't see color. It's, it's kind of like people think that's an advanced um, certificate in race relations. You know, uh, I don't see colors, you know, um, but yeah, hold them to the fire. You do see color, you know, what color is this green? What color is that? Yeah. Well, you see color, you know, and um, yeah, people need to figure out a better way to express what they're trying to express when they say they don't see color. And I think you said it best. You know, I, I don't judge people by their color, you know, um, and look at their character. And so thank you. Thank you all for sharing on that question. Our next question. What is your understanding regarding the nature of our racial problems? What causes them and how serious are they in your opinion? I think they're a lot more serious than people like to give credit for. Kind of going back to the first question, because it's a tough discussion, it can be very uncomfortable. And so it, I think it's, it's very serious. And I mean, there's a, a myriad of reasons for the causes. But I, I think one thing as, as a, a white man is, is first admitting to myself that I have stereotypes in my head. I have prejudices, even if I didn't intentionally ingest them um, when something is so systemic as racism is um, somebody who wouldn't call themselves racist would have a situation or have a thought or act on a stereotype that they didn't even mean to consciously do and so I, I started asking myself like how how would that happen if racism wasn't so systemic in in the fabric of our society and our institutions. And so, I, I mean, there's a lot of causes. Ra um, slavery didn't end racism. It, it just evolved as the era's transition. Uh, so that the institutional disadvantages for, uh, for black people, for um, uh, other, other groups, uh, it just changed with the era's it didn't ever actually go away. And so I think that's part of why it is so serious, is that people, I, as a, you know, without learning myself, I would have probably, not necessarily said it went away, but that it, it has gotten better, which was just some ignorance on, on my part. Uh, and so being able to understand that it's actually evolved and stayed in, but never actually gone. But to add to that, I think a lot of people don't understand that there is a system designed to maintain the privileges of white people. Um, I, you know, talking about the nature of the problem, obviously it's, it's bigger than just the people that are here. I can only speak on 
what I know and my experiences. And there is a big difference between both my husband and I walking out of the door at the same time. When I go grocery shopping, I don't have people looking at me or following me. Um, when I get pulled over from the cops, I don't have that fear that he does. Um, when I go for a job, I, you know, I don't have to fight some of the battles that he does. Um, and just because I'm married to him doesn't mean that I'm exempt. Um, and I think a lot of people think that, oh, well, you must be, you, you must be fine with race. These, these are conversations you, you, you of course, couldn't have. Um, and we have them all the time. And I've even had to recognize my privileges. Um, and I, I hear all the time that white people will say, um, well, I don't have any privileges. Um, and one of the things that I've learned is the privileged don't even recognize their own privilege. Um, just because we are born, we are privileged. As a white person, I am privileged, and I recognize that. And if more people could even just recognize that and know that there's a system designed against minorities um, and like what you said it didn't end with slavery we have the 13th amendment we have Jim Crow and we can go on and on and on but most people don't want to I, I don't want to deal with that that's not in my sphere um, so and that that is a huge serious problem resulting in what we see. What we see is happening today. Yeah, yeah, that's very good. Yeah, I would just uh, add, I, I agree with what's been said. That was, that was powerful, powerful statements. Thank you very much, both of you, for that. Um, I would agree that I think the racial issues are serious. They are, in fact, serious. I think as a, as a, a white person living in a predominantly white neighborhood, we tend not to see oftentimes the things that are occurring and that do go on. And it's easy, I think, to assume that things are pretty good, you know, in that regard, you know, that we're making real progress in race relations and, uh, and the way different racial groups are treated. But then when you meet with and speak with uh, friends from a minority culture from, you know, and you go, wow, seriously? You, that seriously happens, or that seriously did happen to you? I mean, that's incredible. Uh, and then you realize that is a reality. And uh, so I think it is important to realize that and to, to uh, make sure that we have friendships with groups other than our own racial group so you can uh, maintain a firm grasp of what really is going on in our society and, and then what we can do about it. And also get some feedback on to uh, things that we may say or do that may seem uh, uh, normal or, uh, or uh, okay to us, but then to have feedback from someone from another group saying, you know, that could be taking, taken another way. Well, help me understand how that could be taken another way. And then you go, ah, oh, I never looked at it that way. You're right. Can. So, yeah. I, I think that there are. I think that there are, are a lot of white people that just don't see it. Um, you know, we depends on where we live and what we're influenced by around us. But I think that sometimes we don't know what we don't know. Um, and so, to tie onto what you were saying, that to be intentional about conversations, about being with people, about being with other people who are not like us. But I think the other side of that is we can have those conversations all day long, but if we're not turning around then and having that conversation with our, the group of people we normally are with, if we don't have those, for lack of a better way to say it, white on white conversations. Um, yeah. It's not a crime to be ignorant of those things just as long as you have a desire to learn ignorant just means not knowing right you know it's not really 
um, you know, growing up and people say, oh, you're just ignorant. We used to always take it as a, you know, a very negative thing. It just, it just means you don't know. You don't know. So learning those things is so important and, and hearing people's stories, um, you know, that helps us to learn. It helps you to learn and to um, be empathetic with or sympathetic with what they're going through. And so, so when we're talking about privileges, um, several of you were, were uh, mentioning uh, privilege. The next question. So can I oh, yeah. press into that question yes. just a little bit more? Um, I notice you all conveniently missed the first part of pause, <laughs> which is a huge question. Um, huge. So what are, you, what are your thoughts? What are our thoughts on what, where, what is the source? I mean, if we're trying to eradicate this out of our own hearts, lives, culture, society, churches, uh, what 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 are we what are we after here? What are your thoughts on cause of racism? I was thinking a little bit about this and and more in my own story on how this, but I think a lot of what what we understand is we is what we are taught is caught. So I learned um, about black people from my parents and from my grandparents, um, and. That was, you know, that was the only source I really had of learning. And certainly it was much different then than it is now. Um, and then I think as adults, there's, there's a responsibility to be, um, uh, that's right, to make an effort then to choose what our influencers are, where we're learning, to press, to press into learning, um, and to maybe not stay what we caught as a young person. Well, and, and Mark, to answer your question, I guess, I think the cause of it is fear. Um, I think it's, you know, anybody who's not like you, um, there is a bit of fear to that. Um, there's a bit of, you know, we're all very selfish um, individuals. Um, we are all broken and fallen, I mean, we live in a fallen world, and I think, you know, we're very, um, even if we don't intend to be, um, it's that mind mentality, um, and so I think the cause goes obviously way back, um, in the day, um, where it, where slavery began, and it was that ownership. And the fear of, oh, I, I can't speak obviously, but the fear was back when that happened. But it was just, I'm better than you. Um, and then, I don't know if that is the cause. I don't, I don't know why somebody would have a hatred in their heart for another individual. Um, but I think it kind of goes back to the fear of, well, maybe this person is better than me. Um, and not recognizing the internal struggle, um, the internal prejudice, the um, you know the spiritual warfare that we're, we're constantly fighting, and the division that's created. Um, but I typically, for me personally, when I see racism, um, it is fear. And it's funny you say that, Carrie, because. One thing I was thinking about when I w was really pondering this question for myself was off of the fear, I think it's in, in, a, in some of it, it sort of its continuation is an issue of comfort. That, that people who, who persist the racism don't, like they're in a position of comfort and they're, they're fearful or unwilling to make themselves uncomfortable yeah. with any kind of change. Mm -hmm. And so understanding that it's okay to be uncomfortable. There's a lot of the, the saying, you know, if you're hard on yourself, life will be easy on you. If you're easy on yourself, life will be hard on you. It's sort of a similar tie to that, that if, if you uh, embrace the, the discomfort that you can grow and learn from that, because there's a lot of lessons that God teaches us and puts us in situations that are extremely uncomfortable, uh, but he has a plan for after we get through it. 
And so I think it's embracing that, that it will be uncomfortable, right, as white people that uh, if we if racism starts to go away that there will be changes to privileges that we have to the way that we live to how we do certain things and and that that's okay that if if, if somebody says something that is uncomfortable to me that doesn't necessarily mean they're attacking me right it, it, if it makes me feel uncomfortable it's their opinion that's okay i have my opinions whatever they may be but it doesn't mean they're attacking me. And I, sometimes I think that's where then the fear comes in, is people feel uncomfortable, therefore they feel attacked, therefore they're fearful, and therefore they lash back out. Um, and so, you know, the recent events of, I mean, they've probably been going on for a long, long time, but, the, you know, people calling the cops for very, very unnecessary things on black people. And it, that fear, that uncomfortableness uh, is kind of what, I think, kind of projects things out. You could do that. Well, I'm, you know, I'm just thinking about it. I'm thinking about that story in the Bible where um, the people are building the tower, right? And why they're building the tower, the Bible says to make a name for themselves. So it's really rooted in pride. What we know about racism is this kind of attitude of I'm better, superiority. So I'm wondering if the fear that we're talking about is um, kind of this manifestation of pride that we don't want this group to kind of upset ours and, you know, it's this, it's, so there's this disconnection with God and trying to find this own identity in this people group and anybody else is a threat. So um, just I interesting things to be thinking about. And I always think of this phrase that when you can define the issue, you can win the argument. And it's really important that we understand some of the roots of this. I mean, we'll be quick to say it's in the heart, and what about the heart? And, you know, it all went wrong when our, you know, first parents thought they were better than God. He was driving. So, really helpful, you guys. Thanks for letting me press in on that. <laughs> So as, as we're looking at, you know, and we're talking about privilege and um, maintaining your comfort, maintaining your status and all of that and not being um, uncomfortable in your spaces. This next question kind of it's gonna kind of touch on that. How does violence and injustices against blacks affect your day and life? Your comfort? I, so when I first looked at this question, I was my initial reaction was that it doesn't. Which, after talking to people about it and really thinking more about it, I'm kind of embarrassed to say, because it it does greatly affect my life when you understand the context and the perspective. So, one thing, for example, that was kind of relayed to me was, or. Uh, gave me perspective was the idea of when when policies or legislation are enacted to what Carrie was speaking about before that are designed to disadvantage a group of people there is no way to stop that from eventually disadvantaging other groups of people right and I mean there's a lot of ways that that persists but a, a pertinent thing right now would be unemployment right if, if you know somebody who's lost their job because of COVID-19 and had to apply for unemployment, if you asked them how smooth that process was, they would probably say that it wasn't. And that was because it was designed to be difficult to uh, de-incentivize people from utilizing it, um, typically with a particular group of people in mind. And so uh, thinking about, and then now that affects other people, other groups who are now needing it because of situations out of their control. And so that like a lot of those things have trickle down effects. Getting mortgages used to be extremely easy. Now you're signing your life away just to buy a house. So there's a lot of things that I never really had the context or perspective to understand and my initial reaction was no, but there's a lot of ways that I've realized it affects everyday life for me. Yeah, I think, um you know, in society, 
If, uh, if one group of society, one group of society members is unsafe, and is, if there's violence against that group, then society is not healthy. And we are not living in a healthy society. And so thereby, that affects all of us. We all have to live in an unhealthy society. And uh, it, it just is something that has to be focused uh, on, uh, accepted that it exists, and, and fixed. And we need to fix our society. And it would be better for all of us uh, if we do that. So we can't have one group or, or other groups of society just uh, having violence inflicted against them uh, and discriminated against. Just can't, can't happen. And, but it does happen, and we need to realize that. So we need to work together to solve these issues. Uh, from a little different viewpoint, um, I'm married to a police officer. And um, he deals with violence and crimes and sadly sees the worst of the worst on a daily basis. He puts himself in front of harm's way um, every day. So, you know, does, does racism um, affect me on a daily basis? Yeah, it does. Um, I, and I think it just... Well, this one's a little hard. <laughs> Um, it almost makes you angry at the injustice that raises up this kind of violence and, and puts my husband and others in a harm's way. That's really not what he wants to do in his job. No. Um, for me, it's a daily basis in, um, in my marriage, um, in my family. Um, when I see videos um, online of things happening, I picture my husband. Um, I picture you, Pastor David. I picture my uncle, my friends. Um, and I think so many people think, um, I actually, I've, I've had a friend say, oh, well, nothing would ever happen to Michael. He's just so kind and so caring. Um, and that's where I get really angry because I said, I can't even tell you the things that have happened to my husband. Um, you know, being pulled over and, and being told, I have no reason to pull you over, but still has a gun pointed to him. Um, him picking up our daughter from daycare and being questioned who he is and demanding to see a driver's license. Um, even though our daughter is saying, daddy, daddy, daddy. Um, uh, even recently, most recently, when we go out to eat, even in some prairie, asking if we want two separate checks. Um, and um, I mean, things like that, I don't know why. And I can only assume, you know, it is because of the color of his skin. Um, and there's many, many, many more stories. But, uh, you know, he has his story, um, and I am a bystander in that story for the most of the time. I'm, I'm a listening ear. But he goes into work um, having to deal with things um, throughout his whole career and he's in constant fear of speaking up because he's scared he's going to get fired. Um, or he's going to be labeled as the angry black man or too sensitive. Or, and so it, it minimizes um, his fear, my fear. It dismisses the real issues. Um, so it is a, it's, an everyday, it's an everyday struggle for, for me. Um, and not only me, but for him. Thank you for sharing that story. That's, it would have been very interesting if someone would have said, why do you ask that? Well, <laughs> um, after, you know, coming, moving back to Wisconsin, um, it was really interesting because we lived in Milwaukee and that happened constantly. Mm -hmm. um, we would have, I mean, I just dating someone in high school who was black, I mean, I've had complete strangers come up to us and tell us how disgusting it is. 
um, spitting on us, um, running us off the road. Did you say spitting on you? Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, I hate to say that I'm kind of used to that, um, being in a relationship with a, a black man. Um, but then when you have a child, um, it tears you apart a different way. Um, we recently went down south and Vanessa was eight and we sat and talked to her the whole plane ride preparing her for things that, that might have been said to us. Things that, um, I mean, we've, um, th well, things that um, people may give us looks, people may say stuff, people may come up to us um, and having to prepare your child for that is not easy um, at eight. Um, it's, uh, we've actually had um, people refuse to serve us in New Orleans. Um, we've had, you know, we've had things that most, most white people don't experience unless they are married into, into a relationship with somebody of, who's minority. Um, but it, it is scary when I, you know, I challenge our friends that when you see something like a George Floyd, to picture my husband in that position. Um, and then it, it creates a different story for people. And if people speak up, yeah, you know, had those cops spoke up, yeah. did their job, they wouldn't yeah. they'd still be working today. But um, speaking yeah. up is important. All right, next question. So looking over your life, what have you been taught about race and how has, it, how has that changed over time and what has God used to bring that change? Some of you might have touched on that a little bit. Um, I like the taught and caught thing that you were talking about. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I will, I'll speak to my experience. I grew up in Detroit and lived through the riots in the 60s, watched wow. my town get shut down, not even able to leave our homes at times. Um, I went to college at a Michigan college. I was assaulted um, by my black roommates. Um, I was a junior high teacher in an inner city school um, that was primarily black. Um, and I think I've been aware from a very young age that there is not equality. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, that, they're ju that there's just not equality. Um, however, uh, the, the greatest change, I think, occurred when um, God sent me to work in international ministry. And I, got to, I had the privilege of working with different races and cultures in over 100 country countries. And what I learned is that it is my responsibility to understand to understand the culture, to understand their story. And with that, without that understanding, without learning from them first, there, there is no foundation to move forward. You have to have that foundation to, to move forward. Um, otherwise, you're never going to get your work done or you're never going to get good work done. Um, and it's not easy. And I've made mistakes. Um, but... Um, yeah. Um. You know, this, this was a, a great question, I believe, on, uh, um, that should be on here. And uh, when I read that question, a vision and a memory popped into my mind that I hadn't thought of in 60-some years. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I was trying to think, well, what was my first, as a child, what was my first, uh, how did I realize there were different races even? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and I remembered my, uh, my grandparents were from Chicago. And uh, so I was in Chicago and I was riding on mass transit with my grandmother. And I don't remember if it was a bus or the L down there or what it was. I just remember it was mass transit. And there was uh, a black man sitting in front of us in the seat in front of us. And, uh, and we were dressed pretty casually. He was in a suit and tie with a hat on you know, I remember the back of his white collar, he had a tie and everything on. But my grandmother points out, 
See that bug crawling on his neck? Those are dirty people and you gotta be careful. Mm. And that actually was my first quote unquote lesson in race relations, really. It really was. And my and it just and even as a small child it kinda got wow. But then uh but then I started probably not the same day, but I mean later in life when I was still a young child, it, that kept coming back to me. And then I was thinking, wait a minute, I've had bugs on the back of my neck <laughs> and I'm not dirty. Mm. I mean, how does having a bug on the back of your neck make you a dirty person? Mm -hmm. I just don't understand, I don't mm. get it. Mm. And so I think in some ways that experience worked two ways. One, it was very negative initially and, and, and caused me to realize, you mean, I should be concerned about other people who look different than I do. But then it also made me very inquisitive and uh, I wanted to more or less research that issue of why should I be afraid of someone who's a different color than I am? Right. And uh, why? And so, it, so it, it caused me to probe and to inquire and to want to meet people that were different than me mm -hmm. to get to know them. And, and of course, it didn't take me long to dispel that notion that the fact that the gentleman had a bug on his neck is nothing, meant absolutely nothing, you know. Yeah. At, uh, but anyway, yeah. that was my initial, uh, initial experience. Um, I don't recall race being discussed in our household um, besides what is taught in school. Um, but my first memory was when I was dating Michael in high school and my mom found out and she said, I will disown you if you continue to date him. Um, and my response was, well, I guess I'm disowned. And, <laughs> and then I moved forward. But then kind of fast forward, I remember um, my um, another family member stating that I only voted for a certain individual because of who I was dating. Mm. And then um, saying, um, like, why would you want to put yourself in a relationship with a black person? It's just going to be nothing but struggles. And what am I going to do with a black grandbaby? Mm. Um, so those are things that have certainly been key memories um, for me and just really understanding that we have a serious issue even within my own family um, and even within my own thinking, um, not being, not talking about race and not um, probing, not educating myself. So, so how, how has God helped you in making that change you know, that what you were taught and then what you know now is, what part did God play in that, if, if at all you're feeling that? I, I think like a lot of lessons that God teaches us, he either puts us in situations, kind of like what Bill was talking about, or puts people in our lives that, that will teach us those lessons if we listen. Mm. Uh, I grew up in a very diverse town outside Chicago, so I, I was fortunate that I was around people of pretty much every culture mm -hmm. uh, from a very, very young age. I played soccer with people who are Latino from the time, like early elementary, all the way through, through high school, um, to my best friends in, in high school are black, mm -hmm. and we're still great friends. I was actually talking to them earlier today. Mm -hmm. and. So, but, but putting people, so I had this one experience in college. We, it was a class we had to take called social inequalities, cover a lot of topics you could imagine that are within that title, but it was the, I'll never forget the last day of the class. Um, so our professor was a white man, but he was married to a black woman and, and she came in and joined us on the last day. And she asked like, why do you think I couldn't teach this class? And I was like, I don't know. But her words just landed on me with a ton of bricks. She said, because if I taught these subjects, you would have labeled me as a hysterical black woman. Mm. And I felt such shame instantly. 
I still feel it even as I'm saying it mm. because I, that, I, the first thing I had thought I had was I, pro I was like, I, I probably would have. Uh, and it was extremely embarrassing. Mm. But having those situations, I think if we're open to it, like, like has been said, I think it's important to educate ourselves as white people because we don't, we, you know, like Bill was saying, we, I live in a predominantly white neighborhood. There's thing, it's easy to have this sort of this camouflage over our eyes based on where we live that everything is okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, I've heard stories of black activists saying like, hey, it's not our job to educate you. There's a lot of books and things out there. Educate yourself. But then also the second part to that is, is just listening to black people on black problems. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there was, um, I was talking to our, my friends today and I was just listening and, and one of them said, she said that uh, there was comments that I made when we were younger that if she wouldn't have known me would have been incredibly offensive. Yeah. Yeah. Which again made me feel a lot of shame <laughs> because I, in my ignorance, I just didn't have the context to know that that was going to be offensive mm. or just how offensive it was going to be. Yeah. And so I, th I think being open and realizing that we have privilege, that we need to educate ourselves, but listening to black people on black problems uh, and not trying to voice our white opinion on the black problem mm. um, is, is really what has opened me up to learning a lot, um, but also opened me up to looking for those experiences and people that God puts me in and around so that I can grow and become a better, um, a better version of myself that acts like Christ and loves other people that he ate a meal with uh, tax collectors and, and prostitutes and all of these bad people, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. um, but he helped to break down those barriers. And I think that's how we can help to do that is to listen and, and be open to those experiences so that we can start to break down some of those barriers ourselves. Mm -hmm. Well, and to add to that, when Michael and I got married, we did not have Christ as the foundation okay. of our marriage. Okay. Um, we were believers. We knew him. Mm -hmm. um, we were not followers. Um, and up until probably about four or five years ago, we made the decision to make him the foundation of our marriage and our household. Um, and so... Where God has changed, I think, us early in our marriage, you're new to a marriage. There's things in marriages that are difficult for everyone. And then we have race. Um, and there was these burdens that I carried for the white community and that he carried for the black community. And there was constant arguments um, and, and constant discussions. Um, he did fellowship, um, I like to say. Um, and I, so now, you know, looking back at that, God gave me my husband, um, and he gave me somebody who represents, um, the fruits of the spirits of, and he even last week said something to me and I said, you just rocked my world. Mm -hmm when it comes to the discussion of race, that even to this day, he is teaching me um, and is patient with me um, and is open enough to hear things that I maybe don't understand um, or recognize. Um, so God is, is certainly um, working within our household to make it a safe place, um, but also to start recognizing where we need to change as a couple um, and as individuals. Could, could I add something? I know we're dragging the question out a little bit. Could I add something? Yeah. I'd add, um, what's coming to mind here is, uh, and, and I too, I have had the same profession as your husband. Okay. And uh, I worked in the you know, field of policing here in Madison for 34 years and then in Colorado for 11 and a half years after that. So mm -hmm. uh, I stayed in it probably too long. But anyway, <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, I've always had a passion. I think that's been laid on me to to learn from 
other people and to, uh, to learn and become more familiar with things that I'm not familiar with. And, and one of those was, I, you know, I've always been given a passion for disadvantaged individuals. And I, I enjoy working with disadvantaged individuals. And to what extent I can help or assist, I, I really feel good about doing that. Um, perhaps because my father was killed and my mother was pregnant for me, and so we grew up extremely impoverished. Mm -hmm. and, and so having a heart for impoverished groups. Yeah. Uh, but, but I also started a program here in Madison years and years ago that doesn't exist anymore, but uh, where we worked, uh, had adults teamed up with uh, uh, underachieving children in school. And uh, I worked personally with, uh, with a, a black child who was grossly underachieving, uh, basically passing nothing. And, uh, and so I, I, I met him and, and asked uh, why he was having problems in school, which sounds naive, but I want to know what he thought about it. He said, because I'm stupid. So why do you think you're stupid? Because I never pass anything. And uh, so I said, well, how do you, what's the difference between you and a smart kid? Well, smart kids get A's. And I said, well, if you got an A, would you be stupid? No. I said, you're going to get an A next week. And I didn't have any idea. But anyway, I, I, I talked to the teacher, and fortunately, they had spelling tests every week. So I asked if I get a list of the spelling words. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so we practiced those spelling words daily, mm. over and over and over and over, and writing them and spelling them out loud. And, and uh, so he got 100% on his spelling test. Yeah. And so I asked him the next week, of course, I played like I didn't know a whole lot about it. And I <laughs> said, well, how would school go today? Great. And he was all happy. And I said, well, what happened? And he said, I got an A. <laughs> I said, you got an A? You're smart. <laughs> I said, are you stupid? He said, no. Mm. I said, I told you you weren't mm. stupid. But another addition that later, that same child, I got a call from the uh, principal that he had been uh, suspended from school. And, uh, and this was later on down the road. And I said, why was he suspended from school? For, and he said, for stealing. I said, well, what in the world did he steal? He said, books. Mm. I said, he stole books. Yeah. And, and I guess they had books that could be sold to students at very cheap prices. And of course, this child didn't have any money, so he just took some. And so I asked the principal, I said, can you see anything positive <laughs> out of this situation? And uh, I said, so he's stealing books. The kid likes to read. You know? And so we set up a situation where uh, he could take any books that he want, as long as he took them to the office, told him he wants these books, and then they would charge them to me. Mm -hmm. And so he got to have his wow. books. But, but that, too, I think is an example of it just the racism in, in the yeah. system. Yeah. Is, here's a child who wants and needs books, can't afford them, and so let's suspend him from school because he wants a book. Wow. So. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. I and probably went on too long. No, Bill, that's, that's, a, <laughs> that's an excellent story because it really leads us to the, the next question. And you just gave us your answer. It's um, how have you contributed positively or negatively to fostering race relations? And your story with, with the books and, and helping the kid learn, that was a positive, um, uh, that was something positive that you did to foster. So if, if any of you can think of any ways that positively or negatively uh, that you foster race relationships. Well, um, I can share something negatively, which is is really hard for me um, to not not to be honest about, but really to recognize um, within my own family, I have been negative um, with Michael's family. Mm. Um, I have dismissed his mom's experience um, that she had as a child with riots, um, dogs being, um, dogs attacking her, um, having the water hose, um, you know, 
put on her and um, just some of her struggles that she has had um, totally have demissed, um, mm. uh, dismissed um, and diminished um, her story because it wasn't relevant to my story wow. and my time wow. um, here because wow. I don't see that. Um, I don't struggle with those things um, because of who I'm married to. Mm. Um, and also I had a situation with Michael's uncle um, that I still have yet to apologize about that happened years ago um, where I was trying to find a picture of him and uh, for something that I was doing for him and his wife. And I made the comment of, geez, you're just blacker than all black. Totally was not thinking about the comment. Um, I get it all the time, like, oh, you're just so white, you're, mm -hmm. you know, you're just pale, you're whatever. Mm -hmm. But that is a totally different dynamics when yeah. speaking to somebody who yeah. is black. And what I was trying to find was just a picture of him that I, he could be seeing in the picture. Mm -hmm. um, and that hurt him to the core. Yeah. Um, totally, that was not my intention. That was not my heart. I, I love him dearly. We're great friends. Um, he's somebody very special to me. Mm. But those were, and I'm sure there's more, um, I'm, I'm positive there's more, but those were two negative situations that have stuck with me. Mm. Um, wow. and it's hard to admit that mm. I, I didn't do any justice in, in my comments or my thoughts or my dismissiveness. Um, positive. I've done quite a few, mm -hmm. I would hope. Um, but yeah, those, um, would be the negative mm. ones. Thank you. That's and it's hard to share, but we appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I think mine w would probably be mostly negative, unfortunately, and it, it's it's a lot of little things or things that I I really probably can't give examples because, like I mentioned, in my conversation with my friend, it, it's comments that I would have made that I wasn't conscious of the context or perspective or how it could come across to somebody with lived experience of racism. Ignorance. Ignorance. And so I, there have been instances where I, I've, I've said something and maybe I thought I was being funny, mm -hmm. uh, making light of a situation, but I got a look from somebody that I cared about that instantly checked me. Those looks, yeah. Um, that doesn't feel good in any capacity. Uh, and so it's, it's probably mostly negative, unfortunately, because what I, what I didn't understand was that it's not enough to be not racist. You have to be anti-racist. Okay. Okay. Because there's a lot of the protests and things um, that are going on right now, people are upset because there's people who stood by and let George Floyd die. There's people who stood by and let... Uh, Ahmad die. Mm -hmm. There's people who stood by and let so many things happen that internally we were like, well, we don't agree with that, mm -hmm. right? We might say to ourselves that, that that's not okay, but the moment we don't say something out loud, we are tacitly allowing it to continue. So I think that's really where it's mostly negative for me because I didn't understand that it wasn't enough to just not agree that you have, when you see something, you have to say something. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's, um, that, that is what makes people feel supported. That is what starts to allow, really isolate those people who are doing those not okay things. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's a lot of, there's ways that social pressure can be a good thing. Um, and if you have one person doing bad and you have 10 people telling them that that's not okay, that the next time he goes to, or she goes to do that one thing, they might actually check themselves mm -hmm. because there was a reaction from a crowd of people. Yeah. Yeah, Desmond Tutu had a great statement that silence is acquiescence, mm -hmm. you know, that, that we accept without protest. Mm -hmm. um, so um, 
you know, I was, I, I was looking at my response to this question, and I'd like to think that my um, greatest impact was at home with my kids, and we ended up having a slew of kids in our house for all kinds of reasons. But there were conversations, and I'm, you know, it came with biases, it came with our life experiences. Um, but I think that the conversations were important, yeah. whether they were all right or, yeah. or you know, or, or some wrong. Yeah. Um, um, but I'm, I'm hoping that that's where I made the greatest impact. And I know I mentioned it earlier, but, um, you know, fostering race relations and ministry work by bringing um, leadership training. Um, um, that was just, that was, that was a God thing. Mm. God put me in that role. I didn't even want it. Um, I fought him on it, but of course I lost. Mm. And um, it kept me on my knees. I've never been in a situation where the work that I did kept me on my knees to do what he called us to do um, and not knowing how we were going to make it happen. Yeah. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, the opportunity to train up good leaders, because if we can train up leaders, then we can make changes in our community. Can make changes, yeah. Yeah. May, may I, I'm sorry, may I add something else, or are you, sure. we press for time? Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, an, another experience that I just feel that I, I should uh, speak about is um, a, a, there, there was a, a, a kid who I, or, uh, that I met when he was a teenager, and I won't go into all that because it's a fairly long story, but uh, I mean, a, a black uh, young man who I befriended and was friends of his for many, many years. Uh, but uh, I learned a lot from his experiences growing up here in Madison. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, but he was very, very fearful of police officers and, and knowing his experiences, I understood why. Uh, but he trusted me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I, uh, there came a time where all of a sudden I saw that there was a warrant out for his arrest and he was a young adult at that time, not a child anymore. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I knew that he would fight if the police went to arrest him. I just knew he would, mm -hmm. and, uh, which would get him maybe in more trouble. Mm -hmm. And so I took a chance and I gave him a call and I said, uh, I'm going to trust you on this but uh, I'm gonna tell you something that I probably shouldn't tell you, but there's a warrant out for your arrest. And I said, I am going to come down and arrest you, and I'm gonna to have to put you in jail, but I know you're not gonna fight me. Wow. You won't fight me, wow. but I'm afraid you're gonna fight another officer if they come to pick you up. Mm -hmm. So I said, I expect you to be sitting on your front step. I'll be down there in about 15 minutes, but realize I am gonna to have to take you to jail. So I went down, he was sitting on the front step, I took him to jail, and uh, he thanked me, I thanked him, and then I also told him, now that you trusted me to be ready for me as I asked, I get off work at 11 o'clock, and I'm going to bail you out at 11 o'clock. Wow. And I did. Wow. I went back up to the jail, and I paid his bail and got him out. But it, uh, it just solidified a long-term great relationship with a man who had his own struggles. Beautiful. Wow. That is a good story. <laughs> oh. So I love what, uh, I love the, the segue sort of uh, with Brad, you were talking about don't just be, um, um, don't just not be a racist, but be anti-racist. And that is, that is, I hope you all heard that. That's very big. That's important. Um, so looking at that, what have you learned about becoming an ally for ending racism? What have you learned about becoming an ally for ending it? Love and hate, I mean, love and respect, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Love and respect is far more powerful than hate. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I've learned and, uh, and maybe that's just a short encapsulation of a, of a longer story, but, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. but just to love people and respect, respect them. them. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So much better than hating. Yes. I think uh, 
but courage and, and a trust in God. The, you know, three seconds of courage. The, there's a, a, a woman who, who talks about um, the five-second rule. You want to make a decision, you're struggling, count down backwards from five and then just do it. And so just going with that in mind that if you see something or you can do something, I feel like oftentimes our first reaction is to try to have a pros and cons list in our head and try to weigh every option and figure it out before we act on something. Mm -hmm. But by that point, it's too late. And so having the courage to just take that three seconds of courage to just act and having that trust and faith in Christ that that he will use that moment for good ultimately, mm -hmm. right? And having the faith that, um, you know, there's little videos or things of like you open the door for somebody and then later that day they do an act of kindness for other people and how it pays itself forward. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes that's all it takes is one person to start, to take that first step forward and it gives other people the courage and the confidence to then take that step forward with them. And so just having that faith that if you take that step forward or if I take that step forward, that other people will follow yeah. and also do good because love and respect trumps hate. Mm -hmm. And just not everyone has the courage or the knowledge or the situational awareness to take that first step. Right. So our part of our family mission statement is um, to grow in love, wisdom, and boldness. Um, and I think, you know, love, of course, loving God and loving people, um, that's pretty straightforward. Um, and in wisdom, by educating ourselves, by having these conversations, um, by praying for wisdom and then just the boldness piece, um, being able to step forward, to have that courage, um, to be able to, when we are uncomfortable to get out of that, um, comfort zone and, and, and to acknowledge I'm uncomfortable. Um, but this is not right. Um, and this is not what Christ stands for. Um, so just really, I think just being an ally, it, it's, it's, I guess it is being an ally, but for me, it's just everyday life. Um, when it comes to my husband and my daughter, um, I, I honestly didn't, I was shocked when I was asked for the panel. I thought you meant to call Mike. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I was like, do they not know me? Um, but, um, but part of that was fear um, settling in. Part of that was certainly the enemy, um, you know. But a lot of it for me was my word this year is, is to be intentional. Mm. Um, intentional in my actions and in my words um, and I've, in my thoughts. But um, for me, the boldness piece is I need to speak on behalf of my daughter. Mm -hmm. That this is her legacy. Mm. Um, that it, it's not... It is about Mike and I, and it is about what's happening now, but this is about her and her future. Um, so that's kind of where I guess I focus on. Wow. So I had another quote okay. pop into my head when I was thinking this through, and I had to look it up because I couldn't remember who wrote it, but it was, all it takes for evil to succeed is for good people to do nothing. And of course, you guys know that that happens to be Edmund Burke, but he wrote that in 1770. Um, so, but it, it, it sort of, ref, it, not sort of, it reflects what I feel that I am responsible um, to be intentional in my actions. Mm -hmm. Every time, every day. Um, and if I'm not, then I'm being superficial. I am not being humble. I am not being kind. I am not being good. I am not living out the fruits of the Spirit. Mm. Wow. wow. Well, we have um, asked questions that we uh, really wanted you all to address here today. Um, but there was, um, you know, if, if, we had, if, if we had more time, you know, to talk about issues and things like that, um, what do you think? What do you, what do you wish 
that we could talk about, that we could dig into um, and discuss? What kind of things that you, if we had more time? You know, anything that? I think a lot of historical context, right? Sure. So I'm, I'm in my 20s, so I, for a little while longer, um, <laughs> and, and, and there's a lot of things that I just didn't understand. I didn't know that I didn't know certain things that legislation over the course of time, mm -hmm. uh, just social dynamics over the course of time and how that played into certain things. Um, so I think just understanding the getting educated, but historical and current and really understanding perspective and listening to other people who have lived experience. I think that is the greatest thing that we lack as white people is lived experience. Mm. And you can't get that without listening to people who have that lived right. experience. So whether it's from a book or a, a live person, um, being able to understand more yeah. so that I wouldn't make them some of those ignorant comments because I would have understood mm -hmm. what that would mean to other people or how that would come across, yeah. uh, convey, about me that I don't want to be conveyed. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, just having more of that perspective and context, I think is extre has been extremely helpful for me in this journey of, of just even preparing for speaking today. Right. I've learned an incredible amount, uh, more than I have in probably years because I just didn't have the intention mm -hmm. or, or the, the drive to do it because I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> thing is where do we go from here and I uh, you know oftentimes you hear the expression well we need to do something mm -hmm. and that's the end of it mm -hmm. we need to do something mm -hmm. and we end at something now we got to go beyond something we have to make a change yeah. we have to change things and I know the experiences of the past week or week and a half have just uh, rattled me personally and shocked me to the core I mean I over the course of my years, professional years, which now I'm retired, but uh, you know, obviously I've, had, I've seen many dead people. I've, I've watched some people die. I've, I've, I've seen some horrific things, but I have never, ever watched a man get murdered on national te television. I've never seen that before. I mean, that just rattled me to the core. And then to see that committed by someone from my profession just ate me alive and uh, it's got to stop I mean it just that can't happen that just cannot happen and so we need we as a society need to make sure this ends and this stops and so I'm, I'm I think we all need to be committed to uh, intentionally doing what we can do individually and collectively to make sure that this issue uh, is resolved, or at least we move toward resolution yeah. rapid, as rapidly as possible. So. I, I get frustrated that the violence overshadows the protests. Mm -hmm. There is validity in the protests. There is validity in what they're protesting. I wish we could figure out how to protest for something instead of protesting against mm -hmm. something because it's mm -hmm. easy, it's easier to move forward when you are for something. Mm -hmm. But the, the violence that has happened, um, it's just, it it's, makes you so sad and makes me angry mm -hmm. that it overshadows the real reason that people are out speaking, mm -hmm. speaking their voice. It makes sense. When you're protesting, you're pro, you're for something, right? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, like, the biggest question is the now what? Going into what we've been talking about in our series. Um, I think for me, most white families, and, and this is an assumption, um, talk, allow schools to talk about race they allow the schools to educate their children on slavery, um, on uh, Jim Crow, on 13th Amendment, if that's even discussed. Um, and then that's it. 
that's where that conversation stops. Um, I think we, including our household um, as well, um, we need to be talking about this. This is not just um, a one community thing. It, it's, we're a very unhealthy society. Um, I know in the black community, these conversations are happening all the time. The talk is happening to young black men. My husband talks about the talk um, when it comes to when you get pulled over. Um, I just asked a friend I, who has a uh, white son, have you, do you even know what the talk is? Have you even had the talk? Um, and she had no idea what I was speaking of. So those conversations need to be happening um, no matter what your race is. Um, we need to be talking about our privileges. Um, we need to be recognizing that we should be protesting before um, talking about our legislation. Um, all of that needs to be happening, not at the schools, um, but at the dinner table. Um, and I, I don't believe that that is happening um, because it didn't happen in our household growing up. Um, so I can assume that it's probably not happening in most households. So I think that's the biggest question of now what? We can't end racism right now. I mean, the, the few of us that are here cannot just go out and be like, it's done, it's over. What we can do is be intentional about the world we live in, our household, our work, our friends, our church members. Um, we can make those impacts right within our um, area. And that's where the real work starts. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you all so much uh, for participating in our panel discussion. I know it was some, some hard conversation, um, some good uh, thought-provoking things and sharing your experience. I truly do appreciate that. Um, and we, we hope that um, you that are, that are viewing and listening, that you receive something out of this. Um, truly, we are, we are honored um, we honor God that he has allowed us to have a conversation like this and to, in this time, to be able to, to share our hearts and to share our experiences. So thank you all so much for participating. Um, Pastor Mark, would you like to, would you like, is there anything you want to close us with? You know, I'm humbled and um, I'm going to be careful how I say this, but just really glad to be part of a church that's having these kinds of conversations and in God's providence, when we called you guys, not knowing your full stories, just to see how he wove together. Former cop, wife of cop, wife of black man, I knew that. Brad, your story. You know, I grew up in Evanston, so we probably have similar stories. Um, and just how God's at work um, in our lives, and none of us believe we're there yet. Um, but we wanna, we wanna honor Christ, and live like Christ, and love Christ, and. Um, so just a great night and I'm really grateful for you guys being vulnerable and sticking your neck out and um, just sharing with us and it's a good word for all of us and you're right the big question is now what and I'm I know I just said it to the staff today um, I am committed um, as long as I am in leadership here at Door Creek Church that we're not going to turn a page and move on <laughs> So this actually has long been a commitment uh, with the leadership of our church going back to 2006. And I'll be the first to admit we've lost some traction. Um, and we will do better. And um, I'm excited to see how God's gonna lead us in this next chapter to be part of what we've always prayed about, to seek the peace and the prosperity of our city, which means uh, to pray for it, and it means um, that our city isn't prospering until everybody in our city is prospering. The yes. great thing about it, as you've experienced, uh, Bill, as you've been sharing, is when the city prospers, that we prosper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's been our commitment, and we know more than ever mm -hmm. that our city needs to prosper. God's shalom needs to just shower over everyone, and we have a responsibility and a privilege to be able to do that. So. 
uh, game on mm -hmm. with God's help, arms locked together in humility, doing justice, loving mercy. So thanks, you guys. So David, just as we're coming out of this great discussion with these wonderful brothers and sisters from our church, I'm just curious about what were your thoughts as you were coming into this and what are your thoughts now on the other end of it? Yeah. Uh, my first thought is we picked the right people. We picked the right people to um, share their stories, to share their heart, to share their feelings. Uh, I think with people hearing what they were saying is very encouraging because I think it's going to relate to a lot of people um, how, you know, they can be allies, how they can, how they can see how they have evolved and changed over the years, um, how injustices affects their daily lives, injustice against black people. So I think, um, I, I, feel, I feel good that this is a great start. This is a great start for us. And what did you think going into tonight? Were you nervous? Were you positive about it? What were well, you thinking? I was a little nervous then when I came in and saw the set, it calmed me down. Okay. This set is, is outstanding. It uh, said, oh, this is gonna be good. It's gonna be comfortable. It's good. gonna be um, relaxing and, um, and I, our guests will also be comfortable and I think they'll open up. So, you know, my thought was I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure, you know, I had images in my head. You know, my image was I was standing up at a podium on the right, side or something right. asking questions. When I came, I said, oh, I'm gonna sit down with them. Okay. And, and yeah, so. Good. Is there anything um, you wanted to say? I know you, you had the, the role as, as moderator. Um, mm -hmm. I had a chance to jump in. Was, was there ever a point where you go, oh, I wish I could say yeah. something? Do you remember what that was? I'm trying to remember, and I, I wanted to write it down, but oh. there was there was something that um, I, that I wanted to uh, sort of follow up with, and that was one of the, one of the guests was, I, I believe it was Carrie, was talking about um, comfort, um, being right. comfortable, and Brad was, was touching on it too. And that's one of the things that a lot of blacks feel is that we often feel that we need to make our white brothers and sisters feel comfortable. We don't want to make them feel uncomfortable with how we're feeling mm -hmm. or the anguish or the anger or the uh, fear that we might be feeling. I don't want them to feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that, that just doesn't work for us. It works against us because mm -hmm. then we're not expressing our feelings and we're not allowing um, you to be uncomfortable, which we have to be uncomfortable all the time. Right. Right. And so um, instead of being on eggshells with them, uh, you know, hey, if it's going to make you feel uncomfortable, that's okay. Yeah, you know, that's okay. So I think that's what I was. I wanted to. Good. I wanted to push with that a little yeah. bit. But good. Yeah. Um, a week from now, a month from now, what what is still going to be? I know you got an ironclad memory, but what, what's <laughs> going to be at the front of your memory bank from tonight's discussion? I think people doing things like Bill did when he bailed out the kid, when he called the kid and said, let me come and arrest you. I mean, that, that is service, that's love, that's, I mean, that, that's going to stick with me. Right, that was a that's powerful going to stick. He say He could have saved that story. kid's life, you know, because he knew how that kid would react with someone else, right. and he put himself in that, that place, yeah. you know. And that's the wild thing is we had no idea of Bill's background that he was a cop. <laughs> Yeah, so I thought the mix that God put together was, was really good. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, I thought you did a great job, so thanks for doing it. Yeah. And let's do it again tomorrow night. Oh, I look night. forward Just to it. Just kidding. <laughs> I look forward to it. Yeah. Good. All right, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Mark.